Can you see it? Yes, yes. Okay. So let me know when we can start. We can start right now. Okay, we still have some trainees that are here to join us. Uh, please uh, pardon us for that. I will send a message to remind them now about the uh, the class. Then uh, maybe in the next one or two minutes we can start. Okay. So please can go can go ahead. Okay. So let me start. So thank you for having me. Um, today we are going to talk about blockchain in general and specifically about Algorand. Uh, this is the first lecture uh, in which the intention is to give you an idea of what a blockchain is, how it works, and then specifically talk about Algorand and the developers tool to allow you to build on that. So there are a lot of things to say, uh, and I know we have no time to, to do that uh, only today. So I'm going to focus on some section of this uh, deck, but you can uh, find the world deck uh, uh, as op open source resources on GitHub uh, uh, on my page, and you can maybe follow me on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, or GitHub if you like. Uh, OK, so let's start. The agenda today, uh, the, the journey is understanding the algorithm consensus, so what is an algorithm network, how to use the tool, and then how to develop on the decentralized application, decentralized application on algorithm virtual machine. Uh, there are a lot of uh, topics on the agenda. As I said, we are not going to be able to cover all of them due to time constraint. So uh, let's start uh, with the blockchain infrastructure. So what are the blockchain. Uh, I will say they are uh, native uh, infrastructure for digital value. Uh, what does it mean? So uh, I would like to start with a quote from Eric Schmidt that said the ability to create a something which is not duplicable in the digital world has an enormous value. And this is very peculiar. Why? Because uh, let, let's start uh, about talking infrastructure. So what is an infrastructure? Uh, a public infrastructure, like a road, a bridge, the electrical grid, the gas pipeline, are uh, always characterized by some properties uh, uh, that uh, are uh, must stay together in order to uh, be an efficient infrastructure. So, for example, security. Uh, if uh, I have on a public road, I want to be secure that uh, people do not drive like crazy, or uh, if I'm on top of the, the road, the road don't, don't fall down while I'm on it. Uh, then this infrastructure must be accessible. So nobody should have the, should have the ability to uh, shut down the pipeline to deliver gas, because otherwise this is not an infrastructure that serves the public good, because uh, there is a single point of failure or, or control that can uh, power on or switch off this, uh, this infrastructure. So we do not want that. And then infrastructure are characterized by efficiencies. For, for example, uh, electrical grids are designed to deliver and distribute energy, so they should not waste so much energy to uh, distribute the energy, which is the things they have, uh, have been designed for. So the question is, if the Infra blockchain should be seen as an infrastructure. Is that a public or private infrastructure? Who has the control over the blockchain? And who has the duty of the responsibility to maintain it? Now, uh, 
the, when we talk about blockchain as a digital infrastructure, we are in the digital world. So in the digital age, everything can be represented as zero and one, as a string, which is very useful because zero and one, so information in, the, the encoded in bits, can be easily transferred uh, from one computer to another. So it's very good for communication um, and can be easily duplicated. This is a problem because if you want to represent value, uh, you want other properties like uh, scarcity, authentic uh, authenticity, unicity, which somehow are in conflicts with the fact that the, the bits can be copy and paste several times. And how can we build an infrastructure, such an infrastructure to allow bits, so things that are the digital encoding of information, to behave like uh, value, so stay unique, uh, authentic, and so on. And the answer is we need a protocol. And the protocol uh, is a combination, the blockchain protocol are a combination of some technology. So this is not just an information technology problem because the problem we are trying to solve here is not just transferring some information in bits from a computer to another. We are just, we really want to represent transfer of ownership of value or, or uh, the upgrade of state. And this is a combination, problem requires a combination of distributed system, cryptography and game theory and combined together the, the product that we have is a, a public tamper proof and transparent ledger which is trustless. So imagine that the combination of these three main topics allows us to build a ledger, so a record of information that is public, cannot be tampered by anybody, is transparent because everybody can read and, and write it, and is trustless because we have no single entity that decides who can write or, or, or read this uh, ledger. And who controls these kind of ledgers? In the past, the technology uh, proposed a solution as a centralized network in which you have a centralized authority that decides which is the state of the ledger and the other can uh, just access and rely on this central authority. But we do not want an absolute power uh, or a single point of a failure. So nobody should control the, the infrastructure, but everybody should have the power to say, okay, the information that I'm reading here is right. So in the future, the future progress toward this decentralization of the system and distribution of the system. Then we have the element of the cryptography because since, since we have uh, this public uh, uh, infrastructure, everybody is allowed to participate, but we want to be sure that people cannot uh, um, act on behalf of others to maybe transfer value or, or publish information that they are, they are not entitled to. So the cryptography uh, as a uh, asymmetric uh, public and private key or also uh, properties like ashes and other primitive allow, allow us to uh, have a representation of, of, of uh, a state of the system so that nobody can break the rule and everybody can verify the consistency. So the cryptography protect us to have uh, malicious attackers that can tamper the information of the ledger. And uh, uh, at the end, there is the game theory. The game theory is a crucial part of the uh, blockchain infrastructures because uh, differently from uh, the communication like the TCPAP, we need here some uh, monetary and uh, economical incentives that incentivize people to behave uh, uh, according to the rules. Uh, so we need the game theory to uh, have a cost of the attack so that misbehaving is costly and this is disincentivized because you lose value, okay? So uh, now I want to introduce uh, an analogy. So the fact that we are talking about digital things, but we would like to have some properties on these digital things that somehow recall properties on the physical world, so the analog world. Um, historically, uh, a blockchain could be seen as a public ledger of transactional data. So basically a blockchain is a ledger that records 
who owns what. And somehow this has been the scope of the writing system since the, uh, the beginning of the history. People and humans uh, started using the writing system to say that I have 10 cows, you have two cows, and maybe I sell you two cows, and then this is recorded, so property is recorded. And since these ledger, the, the reports, who owns what is a very crucial piece of information, and we do not want a central authority to be able to write and read it. We want to distribute this copy of the ledger in multiple nodes in a network. And the problem is that all these ledger keepers should work together and use somehow same, the same kind of rules to verify that a transaction that has been proposed is really written in all the copies of the network and is uh, really a, 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 a legit transaction, a legit new entry, uh, entry of, the, of the system. So, as we said, uh, the problem of coordinating all these copies, uh, which must be synchronized somehow together, is difficult because in the physical world on the right, uh, that is made uh, by atoms and governed by the law of physics, we all have the same notion of time. So as uh, in, in the physical world, uh, the thermodynamics and the entropy uh, says which is the, the, the arrow of time. So everybody here knows uh, as the same notion of time and the same notion of past, present and future. And also the, the atoms cannot be copy and paste arbitrarily. Now, in the digital uh, world on the left, uh, this cannot happen because, as we saw, the digital bits can be copy and pasted as we like. And the problem is that in the digital system, there is no unique notion of time. So if you take a, a system, a ledger in a state uh, A, and then you bring it into a new state B, and then you take back the, the ledger in the, in the initial state A, is very difficult for an external observer to say that the second state A came after the first state A, because those states are identical. So by observing it, you have no single notion of time. So we want somehow to introduce in the digital world these two notions, the fact that the information cannot be copy and paste as someone wants, and the fact that everybody in this distributed ledger has the same arrow or time. This is why the information in the blockchain is organized in block. So the block refers to the fact that the transactions that are included into the block are proposed and verified by all the nodes in the, uh, in the ledger and eventually are added if they do not break the rule. So this first organization of the fact that the information that goes inside the block is verified prevent us to have copy and paste of arbitrary information inside the blocks because the information is somehow verified. And the concept of chain refers to the fact that each block or transaction contains the identity uh, or the fingerprint of the previous block. So they are linked together in a chain that follow a unique direction of time and everybody can say I can uh, verify independently that the block number two came after the block number one and so on and so forth since uh, until the genesis block. So we have a unique notion of time for the organization of the information during the evolution of the, the state of the ledger. So on the, on, the, on the right, you have the example, a very, a very simple example of a machine which is uh, uh, a system that is characterized by states. This is a system which is characterized by pressure and volume. And the, the way uh, in which the, the, uh, the system evolves depends on the laws of the physics acting on the atoms. And we cannot modify that. So we have a unique uh, set of rules, which are the law of physics that says, given these inputs and given the system, this is the evolution of the system. The problem is that in the digital uh, world on the left, we have a state, a system which, have, which has a state, 
well, state means, for example, uh, recording uh, what is my balance of, uh, of uh, asset, uh, what is a value uh, in a smart contract. So state means uh, different kind of information recorded on, on the ledger. So suppose we start uh, with a, a state zero, so the genesis state. So the ledger is uh, maybe empty uh, with some uh, entry saying that Cosimo has all the assets in the world. So who decided and how we can transition from one state to the other? These inputs they are the transactions that are recorded into the block. And say, for example, that from the state zero in which Cosimo owns everything, then we can transition to the state S1 and Sn until, for example, some transaction redistribute what Cosmo belong, uh, what was belonging to Cosmo initially. So uh, we, the question that we have to solve is what are the rules that can uh, enforce the evolvability of, uh, of this system? So uh, the responsibility of proposing a new block that evolves the, the, the chain is in the hand of the block proposer. So if the question is how should we replace the law of physics uh, to evolve the state of a digital machine, the answer is with a set of software rules that we call consensus protocol that give us the rule to evolve the state of the system. So here in the image, you have Margaret Hamilton, which is uh, maybe the uh, woman that defined the, the concept of software engineering. And here, uh, this pile of papers is uh, the source code of the Apollo mission. So here, uh, Margaret Hamilton is adding a new piece of information, a new piece of source code. So in this example, in this analogy, we can see all these pieces of information organized in a, in, in a chain as the block of, of a blockchain. And Margaret Hamilton, which has the duty of adding consistent pieces of information on the, uh, on the system, on the ledger. The problem is who, ha who, who elects uh, Margaret Hamilton? Who said that it should be her and not me to add this information? The problem is so that uh, we need a consensus protocol. So we need an architecture of consensus to answer this uh, four questions. So who choose the proposer for the next block in a permissioned and public blockchain? Who can ensure that there is no ambiguity in the choosing the next block? How to ensure that in the progression of this chain, the information doesn't fork? So everybody in the system has the same vision of the same reality. So there are no uh, inconsistent states of the system coexisting in the same time. And uh, how can we evolve this system? So historically, the blockchain have proposed some consensus mechanism to uh, allow people to reach this consensus. The first one was the proof of work. The proof of work is a, uh, a very uh, old uh, consensus mechanism in the blockchain space in which miners compete to each other to append the next block. So basically, the, the consensus is, is made by nodes that waste a lot of energy, waste a lot of computation. The first that solves a, a problem, proving to have a solution, is allowed to append the new block. The problem with this approach is that it, re it requires a huge electrical consumption. There is a concentration of power in the ends of few mining farms. and uh, this, this approach is not uh, uh, able to avoid the soft forking of the information in the ecosystem. So there, historically, there have been other um, kind of consensus mechanism called proof of stake consensus mechanism. So in the proof of stake consensus mechanism, the way in which you show that you have a value on the ledger is not because you waste energy and hardware and computation, but it's because you show that you own something on the ledger itself. So the game theory here has to, in the sense that you are incentivized to propose and protect the system because you can show that you will lose something if you misbehave. So because you have uh, resources on the ledger. And historically, there have been several kinds of proof of stake proposed, and somehow they are characterized by trade-offs. So for example, 
the bonded proof of stake uh, required that you put aside a lot of money to be uh, in order uh, in order to be able to uh, uh, show that you have value, so you can speak in the network as a block proposal. The, uh, what, what happens here is that uh, you have risk of economical barrier to the entrancy, so this kind of uh, uh, system is not very decentralized. There are some kind of, uh, other kind of proof of stake, like the delegated proof of stake, in which you say, okay, maybe even if I have a tiny amount of, uh, of value uh, and I'm not able to propose a block, I can delegate my vote to someone else so that that huge uh, delegated uh, stakes can vote on the system. And the problem is that if you have known delegated uh, on, uh, on known delegate in the system, the system is first of all centralized because uh, the decisions are in the hands of few nodes. And the problem is that also if is that if you know in advance who are the the uh, nodes that are going to propose the block, it's easy to target them with uh, attacks. It's like playing battleship. Uh, in a game in which you know in advance the coordinate of your adversary, so you are you know exactly uh, where to 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 shoot. So, at a certain point, the 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 the, the question was: Is the blockchain trilemma really unsolvable? So, uh, can we have an infrastructure that is at the same time capable of keep security scale and be decentralized altogether? And the answer is. Yes, Algorand consensus protocol allows you to have all those properties together. So the Algorand consensus protocol, uh, summarizing some properties, is able to is scalable because can process six uh, thousand transactions per second and have billions of users. It's fast because each block is proposed in less than three point nine second. Is secure, so uh, in fact. Algorand has zero downtime since the Genesis block. The fee are, and the costs are very cheap. So a transaction on Algorand uh, costs uh, a fraction of a dollar cent. So it's not even a dollar cent. So it's very, very uh, uh, cheap to, to, to use. And uh, the, 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 the probability of soft forking is almost neglectable. And then if we have some other uh, nice properties like the, the ledger is carbon neutral. Uh, you have minimal requirements to uh, act as a node, uh, and you no, do not need to delegate, delegate your stake to participate. And you can even participate in the consensus protocol with just one algo. So there are no economic economical barrier to the entrance to uh, run a node. Okay, so the question is how it works. So the the consensus pro the algorithm consensus protocol works uh, uh, thanks to uh, verifiable the verifiable random function the VRF which is a, a cryptographical primitive that allows you somehow to obtain a very magical dice uh, when when I say magical I mean cryptographically secure so mathematically proven uh, in which the people that own some stake on the on the ledger uh, can act as they uh, have these magical dice. So these magical dice, which are cryptographically secured, have this property. So they are they are perfectly balanced. So uh, they are equiprobable. Nobody can uh, make the face number six more probable than the, this, this, the face number four, even if they have huge computational resources. So everybody has their tools. Uh, observing uh, uh, these dice rules uh, do not increment your probability to guess the next result. So you do not learn nothing about uh, the system just looking at the, the random uh, rules. And uh, each dice is uniquely uh, signed. So if I roll a dice, uh, I obtain five, you can verify that Cosimo is the owner of that dice because every dice has a unique ownership that is signed. And everybody can publicly verify in a matter of microseconds each result and the consistency of the fact that if I say that I obtain a number, 
you can prove it without trusting me. So how Algorand use these techniques? Algorand use these techniques to elect the next block proposal. So each algo uh, that you own, it acts like a, a, a dice. Each block, we everybody collectively roll those dice, and the the, the the people that obtain the winning result are entitled to speak. So if you cannot tamper with the result, probabilistically, the more dice you have, the, the higher are the chances that you are going to be elected and propose the block. So these somehow solves the problem that we had in the, in the previous slide with uh, Margaret, Margaret Hamilton, which is who elects the block proposal. In Algorand, the block proposal are elected at random, thanks to this verifiable random function. So imagine there are a lot of nodes, a lot of accounts, they roll a dice, there is some committee uh, of, uh, of people that win, and the higher number, let me say, that win the lottery is able to propose the block. Then there is another dice roll that now elects not just one block proposer, but a thousand verifier that verify that the block that I propose is consistent and is valid. So, for example, if I say that I want to transfer uh, $10 uh, from me to uh, somebody else, that I really have at least $10 to transfer. So the, 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 the protocol is consistent. If all the information is right, then this is included in the block and a new block is generated. And you may think, okay, but how, do, how long does it take to accomplish all these uh, dice roll verification process and so on and so forth? Just about 3.9 seconds. And this is why Algorand is so fast. We can generate a block and verify a block and finalize the state of the system in just 3.9 seconds. In other blockchain, you have to wait 10 minutes, maybe hours, to be sure that a block is finalized. So this is very powerful. And uh, I'm going to skip some uh, some uh, slides here uh, because I want to go directly to the tools. So, what once you have this ledger, once you have this blockchain, what what are the features uh, and what are the things that you can build on it? So Algorand provides uh, through its uh, as the keys and through its tools a set of features that you can use to build web free application. Like, for example, you have the Algorand standard asset, which is a framework on the ledger that allows you to create a token, any kind of token that could represent securities, currency, NFTs, utility points, reputational points, pieces of real estate, or whatever you can think is to a token can represent. And this is a, a native layer one feature, so you do not have to write a smart contract to, to uh, use it. It's just use it and SDK. Atomic transfer are very useful, which uh, because they are a way of uh, organized multi-party transaction in the same uh, block. So imagine that uh, there is Alice, Bob, and Claire, and they want to transact in a very complex way. way. So for example, uh, Alice can send an NFT to Bob if and only if Bob pays something to Claire and, every, and if and only if Claire send a receipt to Alice uh, in exchange. So there is an orchestration of multi-party transaction. The problem is that usually you do not trust the others. So the problem is who goes first? Should I pay Bob? And he, what, what happens if Bob then do not uh, keep the word and misbehave? I lose my, my asset and I don't get my receipt. I receive. So atomic transfer are another future, uh, another protocol uh, feature to organize complex transaction, multilateral, multi-party transaction, so that or everybody is satisfied or nobody is or nothing happens. So no, there is no counterparty risk. Nobody lose anything. Then you have the Algorand Virtual Machine, which is, imagine, a distributed computation that happens on Algorand that you can program. Like you can program your own computer 
the, 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 the fact is that this, this uh, machine is a virtual distributed machine which is very secure. So you can program smart contract to have decentralized application that are trustless. So you do not have to trust the execution of my computer or a specific other computer, but you can set the, 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 the rule of the game and everybody can verify that the rules of the game are, are consistent and respected. Then you have another feature, state proof, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that um, because it's uh, maybe a more advanced feature uh, that basically allow uh, algorand to be interoperable with other blockchain and gain also uh, a security on the, uh, from quantum attack. So Algorand is a post-quantum secure blockchain, but I'm not going to spend time on this detail because this is a, a advanced topic. So what does it mean that all these features that I described, so Algorand standard asset, atomic transfer, Algorand virtual machine and state group, what does it mean that they are on layer one? It means that there, there are um, all those transactions can be written in, in, in the block without um, uh, wasting uh, too much space and time so that maybe uh, one feature slows down the other. So the problem is that now uh, if you want to have a real adoption, you must be sure that all those features can be concurrently be used uh, together on the same layer. And Algram allows to do that. This number that you see here are now, and now I have to be updated because this was, this was a previous version of the protocol. But basically this means whatever kind of interaction that you have, a normal transaction, a, a call to a smart contract, the creation of a token or whatever, happen on the same layer with the same security and with the same cost and efficiency. Now, uh, there is a, a, a sustainability uh, also angle to uh, justify wh why Algorand is energy sustainable uh, and why it's so efficient. But again, this is a separate topic uh, and I would like to prioritize the developer part. So I'm going to skip this uh, for the sake of our time. So. Uh, Let's start with the Algorand networks. So we have described all these uh, uh, kind of technology, but now we have to start talking about the real stuff. So if you are a developer, how can you interact with the, with the network? What are the tools that you have? So the Algorand network is a network composed by two kinds of nodes, the participation nodes and the relay nodes. So the participation nodes are the nodes that really make the consensus. So they propose uh, the, uh, the blocks, they store ledger, they can verify transaction and they are the ledger keepers. Then you have the relay nodes and you have to imagine the relay nodes as a mean to uh, gossiping information all over the network. So that if someone speak, the relay nodes gossip all the things that he knows to everybody else so that the information Rapidly, rapidly and virally propagate into the network. And this is somehow the, uh, the topology of the network. You have this relay node that you can think about as uh, the backbone of the communication in the network. And then you have all these participation nodes that interact. If you want to build a web-free application, likely your application is going to talk to a participation node to submit the transaction, create NFTs, maybe uh, call a smart contract. So you can self-host your node, or can you, or you can use a third uh, party you node know, as a service. In fact, if you want to access the algorithm network, you have to know two information. The first one is the IP address of the REST API endpoint on the node. So uh, imagine if you want to use an API, you have to know the endpoint of the API. And uh, then once you know the API address, 
uh, this or the EP address, you have also to know uh, the the key, the token, so the the authorization mechanism in order to get to be able to speak uh, to that node. So how can you obtain this information? You have three ways to obtain this information. You can either run your own node, so you can take the Algorand node binaries in macOS, sorry, in macOS and and or or Linux, and run your node on your local machine. But this requires maintenance. This requires that the, the, your computer is always up and running, keeps syn synchronization. Maybe if you want just to start uh, playing with Algorand, the better choice is using either a third-party service API. So there are some uh, API providers that are open, public, and for free that you can use just to connect to the network. And, or you have the possibility to run uh, your own developer uh, test network, let me say, locally in your machine using a Docker sample. So you have a container in which you have everything in there. So a node uh, that acts like a micro private network so that you can really use Algorand in an isolated way. Then when you want to switch from the, 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 the local network to the test network, it's just a matter of switching the, uh, the endpoints. But you have everything locally so you have your own private microtest net for your own use. In Algorand, the public network are three. So there is the main net, which is the, the network, which is really uh, the production network in which the resources have va real value. Then there is the test net. The test net is the, the, the network which is public, uh, is open, and is always aligned in terms of consensus protocol with the main. So the protocol, the algorithm protocol version that you find on test and mainnet is always the current one. If you want to have a look into the future, maybe to features that are released in, in, in future version of the protocol, you have the beta. The beta net acts exactly like the test net. So it's public, it's open, it's for free, everybody can use it. The resources are available available to everyone for free, but the consensus protocol, so the feature and, and the things that you have are future version that are then deployed on the on the other stable networks. And then of course you have these private networks, like you said, like I said, that you can uh, bootstrap privately in uh, your local machine to have a test environment. So to install the algorithm node, you have uh, different resources like uh, Linux, uh, macOS, Windows. You can download the, 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 uh, the node and you can sync to the network using uh, this fast catch up feature that allows you to be in synchronized with the network in the matter of means. But for uh, the first time, I think the, the best thing for you guys is using third-party APIs as, uh, as a service, uh, like uh, the one provided by Algo Explorer or PureStake that are available uh, out there. And uh, I will, uh, you have the references uh, in, the, in the deck. So once you have this, this, this node uh, up and running, there are uh, several ways to interact with the node. So the old school one is a command line interface. The command line interface uh, is a way to read, read and uh, so, so to write and submit transaction uh, manually. And this is maybe good just in the very beginning, just to understand uh, how to interact with API. But the thing that you most likely end up doing is not using the command line. The thing that you are really going to use is the Algorand SDK. So imagine Algorand nodes provide an API that is abstracted in some 
programming languages like JavaScript, Python, Java, or Go. Uh, these uh, software libraries are a wrapper around the APIs that allow to interact with the, with the network. So create accounts, create transaction, uh, create an NFT transfer token, and so on and so forth. So uh, another important part of the of the algorithm uh, tools is the algorithm indexer because if with the node you can write a transaction, submit a tra submit a transaction, uh, create a token, a transfer token, then you maybe want to read the state of the chain in order to inspect, for example, who owns this uh, NFT right now, or how many token uh, does Cosmo own on the ledger, and so on and so forth. So you want to read the blockchain. The indexer is a way to read the blockchain and is it a software tool that basically takes all the raw information on the blockchain, process them, and organize them in an indexed way. It's like a, a book. Imagine if you if you have to search something in a book without having any an index, it's very complicated because you don't know how to find the information. The indexer is a tool that organizes an index of the information in a PostgreSQL database that you can actually query directly from the algorithm SDK. So, for example, if you are a JavaScript user, you can really write a simple query in JavaScript uh, that is executed against the algorithm indexer, which asks, for example, let's show me all the people on the, the algorithm network that owns the 10 Academy token, for example, and you get the result. So the algorithm interaction happens in, uh, through these three main infrastructure, which are the node, the indexer, and the key manager. So the key manager is just a tool that you use uh, during the prototype inter uh, phases because it's really uh, um, a, a substitute of the uh, wallet. I mean, in production, user have wallet but if you want just to generate some uh, private key and public key to play with algorithm, you can do that with the, the key manager. The node has an API, and as I said, is callable with a command line tool like algo uh, go al, or by any of the SDK that provide the client that connects to the node. So you have some clients that abstracts the connection to a node, and then you can write the application code to create an account, create a token, transfer a token, and so on and so forth. And then you have the indexer, which has another API that is callable by uh, any language of the SDK to read the information. The most common uh, SDKs that are uh, that you can install uh, are those one in Java, JavaScript, Python, and Go. But there are some other communities as the key, for example, in C Sharp, in Rust, in, in Swift, in PHP, which are maintained by the community. This means that if you go with, and I really suggest you to do that with the, the official SDKs, you have all the documentation developer portal, very well written, always up to date, every, every time synchronized with the latest protocol releases. The community, uh, uh, SDKs, depending on how the community maintains the project, could be really up to date or not. All the things that you may want to know about Algorand are very well explained on the Algorand developer portal, in which you have all the examples, step by step example to, for example, uh, install your SDK, connect to a third party node or complete, even complete some coding challenges which are on the developer portal that are really useful to start moving the first step in Alper. Then there are some repository like also Algo, which are more related to the all the stuff produced by the community. Uh, there are some wallets in the Algorand ecosystem like the mobile wallet, uh, which uh, 
allows you to interact with your web free application directly from mobile through the wallet connect protocol or you have the mobile uh, the my Aldo wallet which is a wallet in, uh, that recalls a user experience like paypal so you have a pop-up in your browser that say for example you want to really confirm the transaction to transfer this token to cosimo and you can sign yes or no and then you have uh, the algorand signer which is a, a, a chrome extension like metamask i don't know if you guys are uh, 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 used to that um, that can connect uh, also with your local uh, so uh, network this means that you are if you are trying to uh, to test your local network uh, in localhost uh, algo signer can actually connect to even to your local algo network for test purposes then uh, on algo you have also uh, explorers uh, that allows you to uh, read everything that is happening on, on chain and okay so i will skip the part of interoperability because like 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 i said it's a very uh crucial uh part of an advanced an advanced feature so just uh, let's start talking about the core fundamental building block of a blockchain which is a transaction so on our brand you have six kind of transaction that are divided in different types uh, you have payment which are basically just trans transfer of algos which is the native current cryptocurrency on the ledger key registration is an administrative operation for consensus so we are not going to talk about it the asset configuration and asset transfer are the transaction that you use when you want to create, for example, a token and an NFT and transfer it. Uh, and then you have the application code that is the kind of transaction that you use to create a smart contract, deploy a smart contract, call a smart contract, and so on and so forth. So let's start with a very simple uh, concept. Each transaction in Algorand, in order to be approved by the consensus protocol as to respect this property so first of all it must be signed so if i write a transaction sending that i want to transfer uh, a token from wallet a to wallet b then the owner of the wallet a has to sign the transaction with the, with the private key signature in algorand are not always done with private keys can be done also uh, with multi-signature account. So imagine you have you can have an account that has a signal threshold of five out of ten, in which is if five people sign, then uh, the uh, transaction is authorized. And then you have another very peculiar way of approving transaction with, that we are going to uh, discuss in another lecture that is through a logic, so through a smart contract. All the transaction on the network then have to pay a fee, which is very low, but this uh, uh, is useful for the network to prevent people to flood the consensus protocol with the free messages that will result in a denial of service. So messages, so transaction on the algorithm network have some cost to protect the, the, the protocol for misbehaviors that want to through the network with useless spam and the fee on on the algorithm protocol could be also delegated so for example if your web3 application uh, wants to implement a, a token transfer but you want maybe uh, to allow the platform to pay for the fee of on behalf of all the users you can do that and then you have a concept of uh, validity and rounds of the transaction but i'm not going to talk about it because it's another advanced uh, concept so all the transactions in algorithm are object described by a json file maybe so uh, 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 with, with properties and they have a common 
either of properties. So for example, all the transaction in algorithm must pay a fee. So this fee property is in the header, the transaction header that is common to everybody. And then you have some specific uh, fields of transaction that are related to tags. So are different from types, tags. So some for payment, some for application flow, and some for asset transfer, for example. So here in the example, you have a receiver and amount, which are some very specific fields for a payment transaction. Because for a payment, you have to specify who is the receiver of the payment and who what, what is the amount of the payment that you want to have. So if you are going to write a payment transaction, you have to specify the receiver and the amount. So let's take a look closely to uh, um, a payment transaction. So this is what an, a payment transaction look like, looks like in algorithm. So this transaction is a transaction in which a sender that is characterized by a public key is going to send to a receiver that is another public key uh, five algo. So the amount here, the property AMT is the amount, says 5 million. Why 5 million? Because the, the minimal unit of the algo is 10 to the minus 6. So if you want to say 5, you have to say 5 million of minimal units. Then you have a fee that is also expressed in algo and the type of the transaction, which is a pay. So once you build the transaction and you will do that through the SDK. So you have JavaScript command, for example, to create a transaction of type pay that will pay a certain amount. Once you build this transaction, you can actually explode it and read it as a JSON file. Okay, so now that I have these, uh, these transaction, how can I uh, authorize the transaction? So everybody could basically write this thing because maybe here you use all public information. These are public keys. The, the, the way you, you can actually authorize the transaction is a process with which you sign it. So in Algorand, there are, and in blockchain in general, you have this concept of digital signatures. So the digital signature in Algorand is uh, implemented using this algorithm that is called ED25519, which is a way with which you can generate a public and secret key for asymmetric cryptography. What does it mean? It means that the algorithm node has this standard cryptographical generator that takes an input, a random seed that depends on your computer. And, and then you have you can generate two information that are a public key and a secret key. So this public key is then translated into a human readable uh, address that identifies your account. So any account in Algorand is identified by a unique address, like you have maybe a credit card that has a number and you, you, have, you, uh, you can be identified by that address. And then you have a secret key that is uh, composed always by 32 bytes and is uh, translated into a mnemonic phrase, which has, uh, which must be kept uh, secret. So nobody should know what is your secret key, otherwise everybody could sign the transaction on your behalf. So this operation of generating, uh, of generating public and, and private keys is uh, really independent from the Algorand chain. So you can take a computer, install an Algorand node, or install a, a standard generator, a D generator, and be even offline. So offline without internet, you can generate millions of these public and secret key pairs. 
Algorand does not care about it until you do something. What what was this something? So let's suppose that we just generated a public key without internet and we now have the connection. So we now can communicate from to the external world. The Algorand blockchain is a system that is described by this uh, gray area on which just an account exists right now. So the question is, how can the, the blockchain be aware of the existence of a new public key on the ledger? This happens once for the very first time, this account sends some algo to the new public key. So once this happened, the blockchain is aware of the fact that this public key that you created offline now is associated to an account. So an account is an entity that has some meaning on Algorand, while a, while a public key is an entity that is independent to Algorand. Once you receive your very first payment on Algorand, the system understands that this account number two is now uniquely identified by this public key. So the combination of a public key and the account creates this new entity that is now able to live on Algorand. So the accounts, which are this entity in, in, in purple here, are always identified by a public address. So any account has just one public address, which is unique. But accounts can be fair from one type to the other thanks to the different signature schema. So the most basic one is a standard account. So a standard account has a public key and just one, a, just one secret key that authorizes its uh, action, like spending a token, creating a token, calling a smart contract. A multi-signature is a way in which you can have a group of people to cooperate in order to approve a transaction. So imagine a group, a board, the board of, of, uh, of, of uh, an enterprise of a group or a family maybe that has a common uh, saving and, and, and the saving should, should be spent if and only if all the members of the family sign. So this is a multi-signature account. And then you have a contract account. A contract account is an account that is controlled by um, a logic, so uh, uh, a program and we usually call it a smart contract. And this is another thought. Um, let me skip this. So Algorand, uh, once you generate a public key and you have an account, you can start creating on Algorand some tokens. And tokens on Algorand are called Algorand standard assets. We have different standards, and I'm not going to uh, spend words here because this depends on uh, from application to application. You can have different standards to represent different kind of metadata associated to the token. So, for example, if you want to create an NFT that represents an image or a file, you have some standard way to express the metadata associated to the token on the Algorand ledger in order to let external application access the content, like the image, the, the, uh, the, the audio file, the video file, and so on and so forth. So for example, recently the FIFA uh, launched an NFT connection over uh, soccer uh, images and videos on Algorand and each NFT is actually um, uh, linked to, to a content, to a video file. And this standard ARC3 has been used to that application. Uh, there are several uh, standards uh, that are 
fitting or not with a specific application. So uh, I, since I, I gave a lot of concept uh, right now, uh, I would like to pause and uh, leave time uh, for, uh, for questions and uh, let you absorb the concept because then there will be a second practical uh, lecture in which you can see how the, the tools are used. Thank you very much, Mr. Cosimo. I really appreciate this section. So, uh, for trainees, I have questions from Mr. Cosimo. Please just raise up our hand and have you on board. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, please? Okay, and then it's you have the mic. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my question is uh, I heard you say uh, it's this algorithm blockchain is not uh, uh, susceptible for a soft uh, fork. What do you mean by soft fork? Can you elaborate? Yeah, so um, imagine a blockchain is a distributed system of nodes and uh, all those nodes keeps uh, a recording of uh, information about the, the accounts, the transaction that happened on the, on the, on the system. To evolve the system, you have to append a new block that says, for example, that uh, some tokens are, have been sent from Cosimo to uh, Alexander or uh, to, other, to other people. The, the, there are some blockchain in which two or three different blocks can be proposed at the same time. So imagine you are following a unique history of, of, of transaction and then sudden, suddenly you see three different versions of the reality in which maybe on a leg my transaction happened and in the other leg my transaction didn't happen. So uh, which one is, is the truth? Problem, some blockchain manage to solve this inconsistency uh, waiting sometimes. So you wait sometimes and after some uh, several minutes, maybe hours, you realize that uh, out of the three different proposal, just one survived. And this means a soft fork. So it means a fork that is temporary in, in the system. In Algorand, uh, Algorand is mathematically impossible to have this fork. So as long as you see a block, as a node see a block appearing on the blockchain, you can be sure that that is the only possible block in the ecosystem. So everybody knows the same truth without doubt. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question, and then please, if you have other questions, let us signify. Dinet, are you still there? Yeah, I have another question. Sure. Okay. Fine. So, uh, if we want to build a uh, uh, our like dab on uh, Algorand, and if you want to restrict the, the I mean, if you want to this uh, system or our dab to be visible or accessible by a certain people, how can we achieve that? Like, how can we have an isolated uh, environment? Okay, so uh, the Algorand blockchain is a public permissionless permissionless blockchain, but you can build uh, application that are permissioned, although the infrastructure is open. 
So for example, imagine that you want to uh, add a token uh, like a 10 Academy token, we could circulate just among a subset of accounts that belongs to 10 Academy students. Uh, Algorand uh, features like Al uh, Algorand standard assets allows you to set up the perimeter of permission in which you are allowed maybe to transact. Or maybe imagine that you want to have uh, an administrator that can actually freeze an account or, and revoke assets from that account, you can do that. Or also maybe you want to build a smart contract in which just a small group of people is allowed to interact. And you can build the smart contract so, so that you have to subscribe to the smart contract and then the administrator uh, has to enable the account specifically in order to let him interact with the decentralized application. This is possible. All the information in Algorand public blockchain is public. So usually you do not write on chain uh, personal information. So you just write uh, ashes of some information if uh, they contain some private and sensitive data or otherwise, the public keys that you use on, on the public network are pseudonymous. So you just see pseudonymous public key interacting with one another, but you don't really know and share the identity, the real identity of those uh, public keys. So you can have a pseudonymity and permissioning and restriction on the perimeter of access of your decentralized application. Uh so uh, if I were to uh, design a smart contract and uh, make the admin to like uh, approve or revoke some uh, accounts, so uh, there is no way for the admin to know exactly who that person is by just looking at the public address of uh, the subscriber. So how can we make sure uh, in a decentralized way? Okay, if we if we were to like incorporate some centralization kind of like if you inc incorporate uh, Web2 technologies and if we uh, uh, have a list of, for, for example, uh, public addresses of like the students, we could put it, possibly do that. Uh, I mean, uh, we could uh, like allow the admin to know who that person is and make the, his judgment. But how can we do that without like uh, going to the Web2 route if i might if i am clear so uh once when you set up a, a a public key on any permissionless and public blockchain by by design by definition the the, the public key is anonymous so if you want to say for example uh show me uh, or, or, for example, let's say that you want, we want to build a ten, a, a 10 Academy application in which just the students of 10 Academy uh, are able to interact. So in order to do that, I have to build a process to uh, couple the, the anonymous key to a 10 Academy student's uh, uh, account. So there are several ways of doing that. Uh, and basically they uh, involves a challenge made by the, the, the backend to the user that owns that, that the public key to verify that behind that, I don't know, maybe email address, there is a person that really owns that public key. And these are the process that you build once you want to have somehow uh, an identification of an uh, anonymous key in your application. And user should know that by doing that, they are going to expose their identity as maybe a uh, 10 academy student. And you should make very clear that this happened. Uh, there is no mean Otherwise, if you don't build this authentication layer or this onboarding process to identify a public key 
that you randomly find in the public space because on Algorand or any other public blockchain, any key is by design and by definition anonymous. So there is another layer, authentication layer that has to maybe connect the, the old web to way of doing things like creating an account on an application in just in a regular way and then prove that that account owns a public key on Algorand on another blockchain with a, a challenges like please sign this kind of sign this kind of messages. Oh, okay, I get it. So we have to like build a kind of system to break the anonymity of the pub, pub, public. I mean, of the participant. Per se. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, the other on the or maybe the other uh, strategy that you have is maybe in your application is fine that people are identified by accounts which are created by the platform itself. So of course, this uh, requires users to trust the platform uh, and say, yeah, I will set up an account for you and I will custody your keys. Uh, and then I, you, you are allowed to use this account uh, with the intermediation of my backend just to, uh, to accomplish very uh, peculiar action in the web free application like uh, withdrawing a 10 academy token or transfer a, a 10 academy token so whatever other action that you may want to do are not provided by my backend so this uh, account is actually a restricted account controlled by a proxy that is at the back but of course this requires the user to trust your backend so these splits up the web free application uh, typology in two very different universes. So there, are, there is one universe that is the non-custodial universe of application on which the backend does know nothing about uh, the user. So it's completely anonymous usually. Uh, the private key is in and, and the duty of, of and responsibility of keeping the, the private key safe is on the user and if you lose the, the private key, it's very hard maybe to, to get your account back. Then on the other uh, side, there is this other universe, which is the custodian universe, uh, in which all the application maintain the control over the account, which is intermediated by themselves for the user. So for example, if they lose the key, they maybe have recovery strategy and so on and so forth yeah so uh, if we like uh, use the second one i mean the one that maybe like uh, the application creates an account for on behalf of the user that would be i mean the private key of that uh, account uh, fall into the hands of the, like the centralized body so uh, yeah. but that's uh, the caveats of like uh, going that route right yeah, in that case, you are giving up some decentralization and, and, and trustless property uh, to gain some other property, maybe like easy onboarding, uh, identification of the user. It's a trade-off. So the, the web free words allow you to do things in a very, very decentralized way or in a more centralized way. It's a matter of trade-offs that depends on the application because maybe you have an application or a customer or a client they really do not care about doing things in a very decentralized way. So they can maybe admit some more central degree of centralization and it's fine for you. So you can implement things accordingly. Yeah, it's very clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your questions and the next. Please give up any other question. I think we have a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, let's, let me see. Are there any wrappers for the teal order than by teal? So uh, thanks for the question. And this is related for Algorand smart contract. We didn't talk about it. So Algorand smart contract can be programmed in, in uh, this language that is called teal 
uh, which is a very low level language, like an assembly line, assembly coding language, let me say. But on top of this language, you have some wrapper and abstraction. So PyTeal is the Python wrapper that allows you to code in Python and then generate the code automatically uh, to be deployed on the Algorand blockchain. There are other abstraction like Rich, which are more uh, JavaScript-like languages. But uh, so I personally advise you, uh, once you start dealing with the algorithm coding on, on the smart contract, to start with uh, PyTeal and specifically with, a, with, a, with a, a, a framework which is called Baker. Baker is a framework that uh, allows you to code a uh, decentralized application in, in, in Algorand, uh, guiding the process of your development to obtain a decentralized application which complies to the latest standard. Basically, what you gain automatically by using Baker and PyTeal is the fact that your application will generate an associated JSON file that describes all the methods, all the arguments, and all the things that you need to interact with the smart contract. So, for example, you have an, a smart contract that is called, I don't know, calculator, and this calculator has an addition function. This addition function requires two integers and so on and so forth. All of this is described in this JSON file that lets you know how to call the smart contract. And the this standard is called ABI. Uh, and the ABI is auto-generated by Python and Baker. So you will have a swagger, like the swagger of the API, to understand how you can call the smart contract and interact with this function. OK. That's nice. Oh, that is clear. Yeah. And the next, do you have any other question? Yeah, yeah. It's just a follow-up question. Is, is it uh, a Python framework? Baker? Yeah, it's everything in Python. There is uh, PyTeal, which is the Python language binding that links Python with the algorithm virtual machine. And on, on top of Python, which is a read, uh, a read in Python, you have Beaker, which is a framework made of classes, Python classes, to really shape and model the application in, in, a, in a more easy way. Uh, you can think of it like a web framework, like Flask, that has some class and things that lets you model the backend of your application. It's similar, but for the smart contract. And we are going to see an example in Baker, uh, but uh, I can share here the, uh, the repository uh, right now. Although it's, it's I, I, I realize it's, it's not useful to do that without a, a lecture before. But for those one that are curious to have a look, uh, this is uh, the repository and the documentation. We. In, in the in the practical section, we are going to look together on how to bootstrap a sandbox, create an account, create maybe a very small smart contract, and interact with smart contract. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have two minutes to end the session. Okay, Wangui, you have a question? Uh, yes, it's a bit, um, it has to do with Algorand. So I was wondering, uh, the current uh, the current reward scheme Algorand has, is mentioned as being uh, tokens. Um, how does that, uh, Okay, it's only for the first five years. How does that play into um, like the pure proof of stake that uh, Algorand um, has at the moment? 
So uh, uh, let me see if I understood the question. So your question is, what does the role that the token plays in the consensus protocol or, or, or... Yes, yes. So um, the, the algo, which is the native currency of the algorithm blockchain is really the, your voting power. So uh, the, the asset is an asset that has the vote, a voting utility. So if you own some algo and you have a very normal computer, like a very normal commercial laptop, you can actually be a node and make the consensus so that the higher is the amount of algo that you have, the higher is the possibility that you end up being selected by the consensus protocol to propose the next block in the, in the ecosystem. So the algo is a unit of account of the algorithm ledger. There could ever exist at most 10 million algo ever. Currently, there are 6 billion in circulation. And those algo are really the gasoline, let me say, that makes the consensus protocol work. So, Wangui, is that clear? Uh, yes, yes, it's uh, that, that part is clear. Um, so, what you're saying is that uh, the algo is the unit of the account. Um, so, um, once distributed, the more al algos you have, uh, is that does that translate to like having more skin in the game as per the proof of stake uh, protocol? Yeah, because uh, ultimately the game theory behind the proof of stake wants you to show uh, that you actually have some value and skin in the game in the protocol. So uh, the more algo you have, the more likely you can be uh, considered a player that has skin in the game. So it's more likely that you want to, to assist them to be safe and proceed in a correct way because you own a value and will be, will be uh, not rational for you to misbehave and, and, and and jeopardize and destruct the value that you yourself own on the ledger. So uh, any blockchain protocol since lives in a very malicious and adversarial envir environment needs to have some game theory to uh, to make misbehaving costly. So to make an attack cost. The algo that you have our utility that shows you that you have skin in the game, so you are entitled to roll those dice and try to propose the block. Okay, thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. You're welcome. Yeah, so please, do you have any other question? So, Mr. Apostomo, really appreciate your attendance. Thank you very much for your usual attendance in Ten Academy. And you, can, you are welcome, always welcome. So, please, can you just give us a, some words to take with us before we end this session? Sure. And all, all the, the, the deck that I uh, shared is uh, available online uh, under the link mentioned in the first slide so if you guys want to download it and have a look at it there are also some topics that we have no time to cover here and then we will have a protocol session uh, just to turn this concept into a more practical uh, skills let me say Okay, I think that's it. So we're going to reach out on when the technical session, the practical session will be. So have a wrist and uh, be a bell. We reach out to you on that. So okay. thank you. So guys, 
uh, have a wonderful weekend and a new month ahead. Thank you. So thank, you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cosimo. Bye. Bye.